And then I just put everyone in the order that they were on the agenda here. Perfect. Does that seem good? Yeah. That okay. seems good. And they were all there. So, yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah. So it is recording. It is up. We're sharing our screen. And... There are already six people. How much time does that go down? 20 minutes, 20 minutes, an hour. I guess that's what I heard. Greetings. Uh, don't be surprised. I muted you for a second. Uh, I just wanted to make sure that you guys could hear and see us in the room. Yeah. Yeah, you can. Yep. Okay. And is the if I I'm a I'm standing up here like a speaker would. Is this a pretty good volume for you as an attendee? Yep, it's perfect. Okay. Wonderful. And we're um. We're probably going to have you guys muted, or we can also do the thing where you can mute yourself so that you can unmute to ask questions. Do you have a preference? <laughs> uh, no, no preference. OK. Well, we'll probably just mute you then, and that, that keeps us from having a bunch of background uh, noise occasionally. But uh, just let us know if you have a question. There's a chat tool and a question tool. So you can go ahead and pop them in there, and we'll, uh, we'll see them. Sounds good. Thanks for joining us. Good job, early birds. I'm going to mute you again. Okay. Okay, bye. During the discussion, we could unmute him if we wanted to. Yeah. All right. And just looking for any other if you need. Yeah, okay. we're set, I think. Working? Okay. Yeah, everything's working. We got some you attendees got who, who are good to go. Oh, they can nice. hear us well and stuff. We can hear them. So, yeah. yeah. It's working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Dan, Dan's got everything under control. That's good. Um, great. So, Kristen, do you usually log into like another one so you can see chats and questions and stuff to do? Yeah. Or I actually last couple I've been doing it on the same one. On the same one. Since this is gonna be up here for them to use, do you wanna yeah, do you have one open? Um yeah, I could yeah. I don't have the internet right now. Oh right. Or I could too. I guess as long as one of us has it up so that we can see. People asking questions and stuff. Are you logged in? Are you connected to the internet? I don't know if I'm 
this is, but okay. yeah, I guess we would need the right. Okay, thanks. Thank you for handling the technology here. It's very nice. Clicker. And are the presentations just like, pulled up in the background? They are all just sitting in one deck oh, in order. Yeah, one. So there's no like going out and coming back. And excellent. All that. Excellent, excellent. And they're just in the same order you see there on the agenda. So all right. it should be, should be pretty good. Good deal. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm gonna go get coffee. Yeah. yeah.
Hey everyone on the on the line. We are uh, just kind of gathering folks here, so thanks for joining us and stay tuned. We'll be get, we'll be uh, getting going shortly. Did you push up the in here? Huh? Okay. Another great. Um, Thank you. Yeah, come on. Yeah. Are you speaking? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
least, yeah. Yeah, uh, so we've been doing these monthly workshops where we try to dig a little bit deeper into a specific topic uh, to give folks background resources and tools to to know more and, and, and do cooler things with their um, with their projects and to see what your peers are doing. So there's a lot of really cool stuff going on around the state, and so we're really excited to hear from folks today um, about some of those things in, in wastewater treatment. So we're going to start quickly with a round of introductions. I didn't even say who I am. Um, so I'm Abby Thinnes, and I am co-director of the Green Subsidies Program along with Philip Music. I work for an organization called the Great Plains Institute, which is one of um, several partners of the program. And uh, I guess just sort of say who you are and where you're from, and then we'll maybe how many miles you drove, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> uh, so Minneapolis, and I don't even know. Like 60 miles, I don't know. It took an hour and 10 minutes to get here. Yeah. Uh, I'm Dan Peavy. I do communications work with the Clean Energy Resource Teams and help out with Green Step Communications too. And I drove from Minneapolis. I'm John Vanio, associate engineer at the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program. And I carpooled from Minneapolis. I also oh, carpooled. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Same. <laughs> Uh, so, Philip Music, I work with Abby, uh, coordinating the Green Subsidies Program. I work out of the MPCA. And I actually met with the Minnesota Shade Tree Advisory Committee Executive Board this morning early in St. Louis Park. So, uh, it wasn't too bad a drive up from the Twin Cities. And thank you, St. Cloud, for hosting us today. Uh, Peter Berger uh, with Minnesota Department of Commerce. And I am uh, team lead for the Energy Efficiency Insurance Team. And we I have a couple of, in addition to uh, helping with the B3 benchmarking and being involved in supporting three step cities, we also have a couple of energy efficiency programs, local energy efficiency program, and the energy savings program. Hi, Adam Zeller with the Minnesota Department of Commerce. Uh, I'm an energy planner with conservation improvement program there, and uh, we have a DOE grant uh, looking at wastewater treatment efficiency. That and I'm Lindsay Wimmer, I'm an energy project manager at the Department of Commerce, and um, I support the work in the energy efficiency insurance um, unit, unit there. And I, um, my family is in Congo, so I just came from St. Congo this morning, so that was <laughs> uh, My name is Jerry Strelin. I work for People Service in Benson, Minnesota, as an operator. In Benson as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm Preston Fuller, I'm a water operator. I'm Kathy Preston with SEH, and uh, I'll take some cred. I'm deserved from being from Duluth. All yeah, right. <laughs> but I drove from St. Paul this morning. Scott Warner, City Green Break. I'm Preston Morales, I'm the local government coordinator with the Environmental Quality Board, and um, help support the Green Step Police Program. I'm happy for <laughs> <laughs> Morning, everyone. Andrew Harris, with Seasons. Paul Graskowski from Winona, Minnesota. So I go to the superintendent of the wastewater plant. We tackle the aeration system. We have upgrades to our aeration system. Uh, for efficiency, we look at the teaser floors that are in their style, so we increase energy there by a large amount. So, but we have opportunities to increase methane production, possibly going to all the stuff that you know. So I mean, we can actually add another micro turbine to our existing system. Mm -hmm. So I just thought a tour of the plant and this seminar here would be very interesting. So let's come here today. Great. Mm -hmm. And Laura Bassett uh, with the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program. And I also thought thank you. I'm Rafi, I'm the Wastewater Supervisor for the City of Huffington, and I don't know my name, but then a 10 minute drive is now an hour. I used to be from the St. Cloud area. <laughs> recently moved down to Hutchinson, and I saw daily crew. John Paulson with the City of Hutchinson, environmental uh, manager. Uh, I got chauffeured here by this Yeah, I work on all kinds of different things from three step initiatives to efficiency all of those Hi, Wayne Simbula with the Stearns County and Solar Conservation District. I work as a water resources specialist, so I'm travel across town. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Hoffman. I'm the 
insufficient the energy and the energy that we have a lot of um, mm-hmm. I do we have a winner? Shame the city of St. Paul, so I work here. I'm <laughs> director of public services, so I oversee mm-hmm. the public works. I'm also the city of St. Paul. I'm also the city of St. Paul. Tracy, what else do you think? I'm going to write in the post of actually right across the river. Mm-hmm. Swim and go ahead. Thank you, welcome. Yeah, don't swim today. <laughs> Good morning, Peter Lindsay from Clean Energy Resources. Okay. Sure, Schneider, the White Group, so we manage and facilitate the Pacific Parking Program, which is really possible. Are we? Sure, would it have people on the phone? I was just going to say that. Okay. Um, um, well, thank you all for coming. We have a lot of kind of different professions and, and different sector types, which is really great, so we can have a really rich discussion, I think, um, after the presentation. Uh, I also want to say hello to everybody on the webinar. Um, perhaps some of them might be even further, if you don't know. Um, and yeah, thank you all for joining um, through the webinar as well. Uh, one of the reasons that we're here is, one, St. Cloud has done a lot of really amazing things um, and have a good story to tell, and we could do the tour afterwards, um, which I'm really excited about, and two, the metro area doesn't, like the cities there, don't really have um, their own wastewater treatment facilities, but the Met Council takes care of that for them. So it just created sort of the perfect opportunity for us to leave the metro and come come check out and see what folks are doing in Gray, Minnesota. So I hope that we uh, find an opportunity to do, the, to do that next year as well um, and get out and see some of the cities outside of the metro area. So, you know, Hutchinson and Nona, if you've got a project uh, that you'd like to share with folks, maybe we could work a workshop around that. Um, a couple of things quick. I want to thank Siemens um, for for sponsoring the workshop series throughout this this workshop year. Uh, it's been really great to have your support. And I want to thank Lindsay for doing all of the work and coordinating um, the workshop today. So I have a clicker. Um, best practice twenty point six is really the one that we're talking about today, and it's uh, it's wastewater efficiency. It's an essential service that all residents of of Minnesota and everywhere else need. We need to, you know, remove our waste, clean it, and, and put it back into um, the environment in a healthy way. And we know that in our state we are facing sort of an infrastructure crisis where a lot of these systems are getting really old, they're energy hogs. How can we think about doing this better? Um, so we have some really good examples uh, from folks to talk about different, different um, approaches that we can take to, to really improve this, this service for residents and to um, find more cost-effective ways and ways that have co-benefits as well to, to improve upon this. So with that, John, you're up. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hi, well, my name is John Vanio. I'm Associate Engineer at MinTap, and today I'll be speaking on the value of benchmarking wastewater treatment. All right, so quick overview. I'm going to talk about Mintap for about a minute and a half, and then we're going to get into the value of benchmarking, types of benchmarks, and some energy savings opportunities for wastewater treatment plants. Um, so Mintap, we are the Minnesota Technical Assistance Program. We're located at the University of Minnesota, and we work with businesses on energy efficiency, pollution prevention, and water conservation projects. Um, that's the quick version. Um, we also have an intern program where we can place interns on site over the course of a summer. Um, at businesses or occasionally wastewater treatment plants, um, again, to look at energy, to look at water, to look at waste, and uh, help companies to be more efficient. For the last three years, we've been have had a special project um, through the Department of Commerce um, to look at wastewater treatment plants and to work with them on energy efficiency to both identify opportunities and to implement those opportunities. Um, and that's why I was asked to speak on the value of benchmarking today. 
So let's get into it. Benchmarking makes energy efficiency known. Um, so essentially, there's a, there's a quote from Peter Drucker that says, what, what gets measured gets managed. And it's very hard to manage something if you don't know where you're at. Um, so benchmarking really helps you to really do that, figure out where you are. If you get an ENERGY STAR benchmark score, you get your percentile rank of where your plant ranks in relation to other plants across the nation. Um, so it's great internally for you to know, is it even worth focusing on energy efficiency at your plant? Benchmarking can help you figure that out. Benchmarking makes energy efficiency visible. Um, so when you have this percentile ranking score, you can easily share that with your funding partners, with your city, and show that either, you know what, it's worthwhile to focus on energy efficiency, can you kind of help us get some funding, get some projects going? Or alternatively, if you're already doing a great job, you can get some recognition, get a pat on the back. If you're doing a great job, you should show it off. Um, and that also gives you some street cred. Um, shows the fact that you know what you're talking about and you would be a really good resource for other plants who would benefit from energy efficiency. Um, but then, you know, on the other side of things, if you do get a low score, it can help you to justify projects. Um, you know, if you're, if you're taking a test or doing a benchmark, so nobody wants to get a low score, but in this case, it can be beneficial. Um, you know, the purpose of wastewater treatment plants is to treat wastewater. Um, the idea is to, to make clean wastewater, and all the plants we've worked with are doing that, and they're doing a great job with that. Um, energy is kind of like a second step. So just because plants haven't necessarily focused on energy in the past um, doesn't mean that they're, they're not still doing a great job, and this is just something else to focus on. So I, I just want to highlight the fact that, like, even if your plant gets a low score, it's okay. That means there's opportunity to run more efficiently. Um, so higher or low, you can leverage your score to benefit your facility. Um, benchmarking results in cost savings. So in our project, we worked with 11 different sites across the state of Minnesota. Average energy savings was $13,000 per site, and that's implemented. Um, so there, there is pretty big opportunity out there in the state. Um, benchmarking sorts scores help, but plant operators and managers are the efficiency champions. This is extremely important. Probably the most important point of the whole of my whole presentation is if you can get your operators and get your managers engaged in energy efficiency to understand the value and really um, get them driving these projects, then it's going to be successful. If there's a disconnect there and there's um, it's sometimes it's perceived as you know someone from outside of the plant trying to tell you how to run. It's not what it is, but it can be perceived that way. If that's how it's perceived, projects aren't going to work. So make sure you get the plant staff on board because ultimately the projects are going to become their projects. Um, and they're going to be the champions that push them forward. Um, so a summary of the value of benchmarking. The purpose of it is to find your energy efficiency relative to other plants and then to use that score to really leverage projects and to get things done. Um, so now we'll move into types of benchmarks. There's three primary types of benchmarks for wastewater treatment plants. You have the hydraulic flow benchmark, the BOD load benchmark, and the energy star benchmark. Um, the first two aren't as important as the third one, so if you're going to fall asleep, I'll give you two minutes. <laughs> um, your hydraulic flow benchmark um, is in kilowatt hours per million gallons, so that's the energy you use per unit of flow. Um, so here you can see kind of a graph of some plants in Minnesota. And you can see the trend is as flow increases, plants use less energy per million gallons treated. However, in the typical range of most plants in Minnesota, there's like 0 to 2 MGD range, there's a lot of variation in efficiency that you can see right from this graph. And that means that there's a lot of opportunity to save energy, or potentially a lot of opportunity to save energy at these plants. Um, so your hydraulic flow benchmark typically ranges from about 5,000 kilowatt hours per million gallons to about 1,500 kilowatt hours per million gallons. And you can calculate this yourself pretty easily. Take your monthly bill from last month, figure out how many kilowatt hours you used, figure out how many million gallons you treated, do the math, and figure out where you are on the spectrum. And that'll, that can give you a sense, a first sense, of where you're at in terms of efficiency. Um, the next benchmark is the BOD load benchmark. This is your kilowatt hours per kilogram of BOD treated. Um, so this is ideal. You know, there's more than just flow that, that a plant is treating. They're also treating the actual waste, the actual strength. Um, so this is better for plants where the actual BOD loading is more significant than the flow. Um, but it's got the, the, basically exactly the same way. You take your energy and you divide it by the kilograms of BOD treated. Um, there's a similar graph here. You see the same pattern, plants that treat more BOD tend to do so more efficiently, but in the BOD range for most plants, there's again a lot of variability there. 
and potentially a lot of opportunity to save some energy. Um, so again, very similarly, you can calculate your BOD benchmark, figure out where you fall on the spectrum, and get a sense for your efficiency. Right, so if you fell asleep, this is the time to wake up. This is the important one. This is the Energy Star Portfolio Manager score. And so what this does is it takes the information from the previous benchmark. So it takes your flow, it takes your BOD removal, and your energy consumption. But then it also takes your fuel consumption, takes into account your climate, whether you have a trickle filter, whether you're doing nutrient removal, and it smashes all that data together and outputs one number, which is your percentile rank comparing to other plants throughout the nation of where you fall um, on energy efficiency. Um, so this score will be anywhere from 1 to 100. And I guess as we talked about before, if you get a lower score, that's indicative that there is potentially low-hanging fruit uh, with regards to energy efficiency opportunities. And if you get a high score, you should be sharing what you're doing with other plants. Um, now, the caveat with the Energy Star score is that it was designed for plants with flow greater than 0.6 MDD, greater than 600,000 gallons per day. Um, so if your plant is smaller than that, you can still generate a score. It's not an official Energy Star score. It's not necessarily going to be as accurate, but it can still give you a sense for how efficient your plant is. Um, so here we have a chart that kind of showcases another way you can use your benchmark score. So we have three different categories of plants. And you can see, based on their score, how much they pay for energy. So a very low flow plant, 0.37 to 0.41 MGD, with a low score pays about $100,000 a year in energy. With a high score, they pay about $30,000 a year in energy. So that's about $70,000 on the table for energy efficiency if your plant is very small and has a very low score. Um, you can look at a bigger plant, 1.2 to 1.6 MGD. Low score might pay about $300,000 a year in energy. High scores at about 125,000. So again, that's about 175,000 dollars in energy opportunities um, potential for for this type of plants. And then finally, for the largest plants, they're spending 800,000 dollars a year in energy if they have a very low score. And energy might cost 450,000 dollars with a score that's a little over fit at 63. So that's not even the best score possible, but you know it's in the right direction. There's a, again, there's a lot of opportunity to save money on energy by increasing your benchmark score. Um, so with that, we will get into energy saving strategies. And I didn't check the time. How am I doing on time? Yeah. All right, yeah. doing fine. So um, we had a project. We worked with 11 plants throughout the state. Uh, we found opportunities up to about $450,000 in recommendations total. And about a third of that has been implemented so far. Um, so I guess the difference there is some most of what's been implemented are the no and low cost opportunities. Um, then opportunities that require capital, like some new equipment or VFDs, tend to take a little bit longer, so those haven't been done yet. And then there are some, some um, recommendations that are still TBD. We'll see what happens with them. Um, but so far, about $13,000 in savings has been implemented per site. So how did we do it? What are the things that you look for in a wastewater treatment plant? I'm going to go over the top few things that we look at whenever we go into a plant. Um, maybe, hopefully, um, can help some people, help inspire some people to find some energy, energy savings. So the first thing we look at is secondary aeration. Um, look at the secondary basin and look at the DO. Is the DO over two parts per million? If it is, you probably have an opportunity to save some energy. Um, so basically, microorganisms in your secondary aeration basin, they need oxygen to treat the wastewater. But if you give them more oxygen than two parts per million of dissolved oxygen, um, it's, that oxygen is being wasted. Um, the, the microorganisms can't use it, and then they're not going to be any more effective. Um, that's just excess oxygen. And that, that oxygen is developed. Um, it's sent to the basin, typically through a blower that uses a lot of energy to generate airflow. Um, and so what ends up happening, if you look at it kind of from the macro point of view, is that energy is, is generated somewhere, typically generated using fossil fuels here in Minnesota. So we're actually polluting the air in order to treat the water. Um, so that's why we really want to try to only use as much energy as we need to treat this wastewater. There's, okay, a, black, so, there's a blackout button. Just gotcha. hit that one. Perfect. <laughs> um, so this kind of gives you another way to look at it in terms of dollars. This was a colleague of mine put this together for one of the plants he worked with on this project. He found that to, 
to generate eight parts per million of dissolved oxygen in the second generation basin, costed about $18,000 in energy. And generating only two parts per million for the basin costed about $6,000 per year. So this was like an average size plant in Minnesota. And the savings here is about $12,000 for that one change. Per year. Per year, yes. Um, so how do you do this? Well, if you have a VFD that can turn down, uh, sometimes it's as easy as turning on down the VFD. You have to be careful because if you turn it down too far, your blower will start to surge or overheat. Um, so you have to be careful with that. If you don't have a VFD, you might be able to put one on and um, do something similar. Um, another option, you can get a smaller piece of equipment. So typically, um, sites are designed for their design load. But a lot of the plants in Minnesota are operating at a load that's much lower than their design load, which means that equipment's oversized. Um, so if you can get a blower, a smaller blower, smaller piece of equipment that can run efficiently at your normal or typical loads, you can save a lot of energy that way. Um, and then a final option, this is something that is still kind of being tested at one of the sites we worked with, um, but it's possible you can actually cycle your secondary aeration blower on and off. When the blower is off, you turn on a mixer. And when the blower is on, essentially what you're doing is you're increasing that DO from two up to about six or seven. And then when it's off, it's falling back down to two. Um, so you're not generating saturation oxygen and you're getting a little closer to ideal. Um, the next thing you can look at is your aerobic digester aeration and see is there an opportunity to reduce aeration here. Um, the 10 state standards recommends 30 SCFM for 1,000 cubic feet of sludge. Um, and many sites can and are running even lower than this. Um, again, you know, you can do the same things with the blower that you did with the secondary aeration. Um, however, I will make a note that cycling equipment on and off in this case is actually much more common in Minnesota. Many plants were already doing this before we started assessments, and we were able to kind of help them find more optimal points to do the cycling. Um, something to be careful of is you don't want your sludge to turn anaerobic. Um, so you want to make sure that DO isn't falling too much further below one during your off cycles. What was the number? I'm sorry, what was the number again? So it's 30? 30, 30 standard cubic feet per minute per 1,000 per cubic one, feet of sludge. Per 1,000. Um, and that's in the, if you Google like 10 state standards, you can pull up like all of this typical standards for the Midwest for wastewater treatment plants. And that's kind of a good place to get baseline numbers. Okay. Um, all right, so then you can look at an aerobic digestion, you can look at the detention time. And you can say, is there an opportunity to reduce that? Um, again, the 10 state standards kind of starting point is 27 days. And some sites can run lower than this as well. Um, you can test this by doing a standard oxygen uptake rate test or a sour test on your sludge. And this will tell you when your sludge is stable. So conceivably, you can do this after 20 days of digesting, after 25, after 30, figure out how long does it actually take us to stabilize your sludge. Um, and then from that point, you know how long you need to digest. And so one example site that I had, they were running two digesters at roughly 60 days of detention time. So when we brought them down to 30 day detention time, now they only needed one digester on, which cut their digester blower aeration in half saving them a lot of money and a lot of energy. Um, and then something else you can look at if you have an anaerobic digester, you can look at combined heat and power system. Um, so anaerobic digesters, they run without air, they generate methane. Um, typically that methane is flared. However, um, with this system, you can take that methane and burn it for heat and energy for the plant, reducing your um, electric energy usage from the grid. And so we, we did, um, a few different um, assessments with different sites through Minnesota, um, small to mid-sized sites, and they found payback periods ranging from four to 10 years on CHP. And I will, I don't have it in the slides, but I will give a shout out to CHP TAP. They are in Illinois, and they were our partners on this, and they offer no cost screening assessments for CHP for any sites in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. So if you're at all interested in CHP, um, give them a call or reach out to me and I'll connect you. Um, case study examples, so we do have a bunch of examples from our projects in the back there um, in a packet, so please pick one up um, and check them out. Worked with plants, um, you know, fine bubble aeration plants, oxidation ditches, worked with aerated ponds, um, 
bunch of different types of plants, and hopefully the idea is it can inspire you, give you an idea on what you might be able to use your plant. Um, and I'll, so I'm going to end with this. The magnitude of these opportunities is expected to correlate with your benchmark score, and benchmarking is the first step towards efficient wastewater infrastructure. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Yeah. Maybe questions at the end? Um, right. Pascal, no questions for Jen? <laughs> All right. A lot of information to process. Over so I'm Sherry Schneider with the White Group. We manage and facilitate the B3 benchmarking program for the state of Minnesota. And we will talk about, get this one right way, um, some of the benchmarks that John mentioned in his presentation. A little bit of history. So in 2001, the state um, legislation mandated that public buildings benchmark at least one year of energy. And at the time, that did not include wastewater treatment plants. It was for buildings 5,000 square feet and up. In 2004, the initial B3 benchmarking application was developed. If anyone was using it back then, it was very crude. So hopefully you stuck with us and are enjoying the new current version of it. Today, we've got over um, 527 million square feet in over 12,000 buildings. So there's a lot of people um, within the state that have been benchmarking their buildings, and we benchmark over 50 different buildings um, with 60 different space types. So today is all about wastewater treatment plants, but it is good for any buildings um, within your city. So who has never seen B3 benchmark? Anybody? Everybody's seen it? One? You haven't seen it? All right. So this is what our homepage looks like. It's mn.b3benchmarking.com. So hopefully a very simple uh, web address to remember. Any of the menus here across the top are all public. So you go ahead, check it out. Um, under reports, there's a lot of public information available. Um, you do need a login to get to the secure section. And that just kind of controls what you have access to, whether you can read, edit, view, um, and the different organizations and sites. Across the bottom here in this black banner, We've got our contact form, so if you have someone in your organization that does need an account, go ahead and click on the request access and fill it out, and we'll get them set up. So today, we are going to talk about data entry. So getting all of your data into B3 benchmarking, whether that's flow data, energy data, attributes, the different metrics that are available, and then some of the reports, which will um, provide those numbers that John was talking about in his. And then we do have just kind of a informational page for wastewater treatment plants um, website there. And I did a little call out to St. Cloud. I borrowed one of their slides because um, obviously they do an awesome job, which we're going to hear from them. Um, it was very colorful with all of their PV in there. So getting data into benchmarking. The state of Minnesota provides us um, actually, MPCA provides us with the DMR data on a quarterly basis. And what that's giving us is all of these attributes. So what John talked about, the information that Energy Star requires to get those scores, um, you report that via your DMR data. So we get that. And then we also get all of the flow data that you send in. So on a quarterly basis, that gets updated into B3 benchmarking automatically. Nothing that you guys need to do. It is helpful. It's a nice, clean interface to see what data is in, and it can really easily find errors. So obviously, a little extra decimal place here. Um, so looking through your flow data in this view, you can quickly see any potential errors. Any corrections do need to go back through the DMR. Don't, I mean, you can update benchmarking to see um, and reflect on your current score. But if it doesn't get updated in DMR, that same error is going to get populated the next quarter again. So if you do see anything that needs to be corrected, make sure it does get corrected in the DMR. So, so Sherry, does this mean that every city that has DMR data also has already a, a B3? A wastewater treatment plant site already in was created automatically in B3. And it's still there. So if the city has done nothing, nothing. there is a wastewater treatment plant site. There is, OK. Yep. So this is all from DMR. You guys don't have to do anything to get this data in. On the energy side, this is where you guys need to step up. So to 
that point, every site has an electric meter that was automatically created. If you don't have electric for your plant, let us know. We can kind of flag it so that it doesn't give you error messages about missing electric data. But for the most part, there is some form of electricity um, for a lot of the plant types. So um, we have got a couple different means of getting it in, which I'll go through. Like I said, there's a default electric meter. If you're like St. Cloud and you've got all this great PV that's also servicing your plant, we have the option to add a meter and you can pick the various types. Maybe you've got natural gas. Um, we do not currently have biofuel. I know St. Cloud um, was kind of doing a workaround and converting any of that to KBTUs and putting it in as a, I believe they have PV removal set up. So they're kind of um, working around the system that we've got available right now so that they can keep track of that bio uh, fuel source that they're utilizing um, and still account for it. To get the metrics that we're going to go through next, you need at least 12 months of data for all of those active meters. Um, and it needs to be continuous. So you can't have you know, 12 months from 2016 of electric and 12 months of natural gas in 2017. They need to coincide over the same 12 month period. So Sherry, if they have any, currently the data that's imported <coughs> does not include any energy, so it won't be overwritten. Right. What we get from DNR is strictly attributes, the Energy Star attributes um, that's available on the Energy Star page and the flow data. So there were a few plants um, prior to us importing the DMR data that already had their energy data tracking, and they were using it more of just the baseline metric, which we'll go through. We just melded those two sites together, pulled all the flow data in, and voila, they got their metric. So a wastewater treatment plant is a in the building editor, it's just a type of building? Is that how it's? Yes and no. So in benchmarking, we benchmark a building so benchmarking um, by default is building a simulated model of the building. So for a standard building, the energy assumption is based on the square footage, the type of space types, the hours of operation. That doesn't hold truth for a wastewater treatment plant, which is why in the past we never benchmark wastewater <coughs> treatment plants because it has nothing to do with the size of the building and everything to do with flow. So it's, it looks like a building, but it doesn't act under the... Okay. Uh, kind of behind the scenes as a building, but it does look like a building. Um, it's just if you click on it, you won't get a building editor with space types and hours of occupancy. You'll get just the site editor. Okay. Good questions. So one means of getting energy data in is just through the meter editor. So you click on <coughs> add a reading, you type in a start date, end date, consumption, save, close. And that's great if you're up to date and you just have a monthly bill that you're putting in and you're kind of keeping your data current. If you've got no information and you want to enter in a bunch of historical data, we've got an import wizard and this is all done via spreadsheet and I'll demonstrate it here shortly. But you'll create a import template. You can copy and paste however you've got that historical energy information. You'll save it and then go back and import a completed worksheet and that will just populate all of that historical data. Um, and you can get a lot of times from your utility, they'll provide some form of uh, export available, or if you've been tracking it in some other application um, and your ability to export it out into Excel, you can just copy and paste. So on to the metrics. Any uh, questions about getting data in? Yeah, okay. So Energy Star, as John mentioned, Energy Star Portfolio Manager does provide a 1 to 100 score. So we tapped into our integration that we already have with Energy Star, gathered those additional attributes that we got from the DMR data, and we're sending it through just like we do with the building. And for eligible plants, we bring back the Energy Star score. So here is their um, requirements, their criteria for what is eligible for a score. And as John mentioned, it's above the 0.6, and then most other plants kind of fall within those ranges. If you're a smaller plant, and you don't fall within that criteria, as you mentioned, we still calculate a score. Not as accurate, but still useful to kind of give you an idea of how you're doing. So as you can see here, it doesn't have the little Energy Star icon up there. And we give this little disclaimer. There are a few types of plants that don't get any score. And it's these three. And you'll just get a message in benchmarking that says that your particular type of these three are not eligible. 
but we still have benefits for you. You go to reports, which we'll go through in a minute. Um, we'll show where you can still utilize that. The B3 peer ranking, so for most buildings, this is based on your benchmark index ratio. Since we don't benchmark wastewater treatment plants, we're utilizing the score to kind of tell you how you rate against your peers. So it's a 1 to 100, um, and in this case here, our wastewater treatment plant has a score of 80. Um, it's comparing, there's currently 22 wastewater treatment plants that are benchmarking, really 21, because one of them is our demo site. Um, so 21 um, wastewater treatment plants throughout the city have entered in their energy data and are getting scores. And that's kind of where all of them fall. Baseline, so whether you have a score or not, you can baseline your plant. And this is what some plants were doing prior to us even having the benchmark score. So again, you need 12 months of data, and ideally you'd need to have 24 months so that you could actually compare back to a 12-month period. If you're comparing the same 12 month period, obviously your percent change is zero. But we've got the consumption, the dollars, and the carbon for the particular fuel sources that are servicing your plant. You can pick a 12 month period. You know, ideally you'd go back and potentially pick like the first 12 months that you have energy data and see how you're doing since then, or right before an efficiency, so you could see how you're doing after the efficiency. We've got a couple of different normalization op options. You can weather normalize. So taking weather out of the equation, you've got actual or baseline. The state of Minnesota, for all of their reporting, does actual weather normalization. Um, you can also baseline. And does anyone need me to get into those methods? No. Um, flow rate and BOD removed. So these are the other two benchmarks that John talked about. And we will show those in the report. So those are kind of the three of the four main metrics that B3 Benchmarking offers. And we've got our reports here. So clicking on the reports tab, we've got the normalization options here. So right now I am flow rate normalized with baseline weather normalization. And you can see here that my access has changed to KBTUs per million gallons. And so this is how our demo site is doing. We're between 6 and 8,000. Switching that, now I've got the BOD removed. And I'm actually in native units, and since I only have electricity, I'm looking at the KWH per kilograms of BOD removed. So I'm kind of between two and three there. So you can get those other benchmarks that John talked about, um, even if you can't get a score, either an ENERGY STAR score or a manually calculated score, there's still benefit of having your information in with your benchmarking. So with that, I am going to jump to a quick demonstration and show you. Yeah. And I just realized that my import template is on my computer. I never sent it to <laughs> Lindsay. So here is our demo wastewater treatment plant. So as you can see, we already have information through the end of 2016. You're actually in the benchmarking tool. I am in the tool itself. And I logged in too long ago. Our new security features have <laughs> kicked me out. So you've got to demo that too. So <laughs> if you haven't logged in lately, we have upgraded security so that the application times out within um, 20 minutes of inactivity and to type and talk at the same time. First try, good job. <laughs> well, I already had a test here. I was like thinking about it when I logged in the first time, so. All right, demo support, wastewater treatment plant. So for wastewater treatment plants, that have never been in, you'll have my electric meter. It won't have a first reading or a last reading because there won't be any energy data in yet. And just to show you, if I'm clicking, for those that are familiar with benchmarking, normally clicking on the building name would bring up the building editor. Instead, I get the site editor, and then here are those <coughs> attributes that we're getting from the DMR data. 
So again, if you see anything that's inaccurate, um, any of the DMR data won't be using defaults. It's our demo site, so we're just leaving the defaults. But if you see any uh, errors, make sure that it is corrected at DMR data. So clicking on the electric meter for a new site, this would all be blank. You can add a new reading just by clicking the orange add reading button here. By default, the start date is going to match the previous reading's end date. If you have no data, it'll just be blank. But we'll just bump this up. Um, what is that? 28. And we'll give it some consumption. This is why our scores are so good, because I just make numbers up. <laughs> 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 Um, so and we also have demand ability, so if you do have demand meters, we can track the peak demand and we want to make sure that the actual demand that goes in and not the build demand. And then you can track um, enough decimals, whoops, too many. So here's a good uh, per unit. So the per unit and the consumption numbers are calculated from the application and they're great as kind of air checkers. So you can see I've been averaging six, seven cents, and all of a sudden I'm at 80 cents. Whoops! Let's delete one of my decimal places here and get us back down. The consumption bar graph is based off of your consumption number. So as we saw in that flow meter, it was all of a sudden off the chart um, when we had a really high flow number. So this is one way to get data in. Again, this is great if you're up to date and you're just getting your monthly bill and you're putting it in once a month. Um, not too much work to get that in. The other option that we have is our import template. So that's this middle icon in the upper right hand corner. The first step is to generate the spreadsheet template. Then we'll go ahead and download it. And what you're going to see if you do have any energy data already loaded, it's going to show up as existing rows in this template. You can edit them, so if you have consumption data and you found that you were able to track down cost data, you can go back in and just key it into those rows and it'll automatically update. If you'll notice, the dates are gray, so those cannot be modified. This is kind of what ties that record to the particular reading in benchmarking, as well as all of this information up on top. It's kind of the internal linkages so that when you import this back, it knows where to actually put the data. So since I don't have my import template that I um, grabbed, you go out to Excel or whoever your utility is, you log into your account. A lot of times they'll give you the option to download 12 months, 24 months. Um, each utility is a little bit different, and you can usually pick whether it's a CSV file or an XLS file. And a lot of times you'll have a read date, potentially a start date, end date, depending on what it looks like. A read date would be your end date, so you just kind of need to utilize the previous reading's read date to be that reading's start date, if that makes sense. But a lot of just copying and pasting. Select a chunk, paste it into this template, take your consumption, paste it into the right column, take your charges, paste it into the right column. I'm just going to go ahead and create a couple here. Enable. Yes, oh. I didn't click my yellow. So it read my mind and did it for me. <laughs> so just for the sake of time, I'm just going to enter in one here. Actually, I'll do two and show you um, some of the warnings. <coughs> enough numbers. And if you'll notice, I skipped a day here, and I kind of did that on purpose. My day is 2017. This big number, oops. Okay, so I've added just two readings, and I'm going to go up and say, whoops, this one, we've got a couple more demand numbers. So I'll add a couple more. So I've added two readings and I've modified two readings. 
I'm going to go ahead and save this. Do you mind if I save this to your desktop? Go for it. It's easy to find. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Desktop. All right, let's pull out of that. So I intentionally cleaned up my desktop just so that it wouldn't be embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm doing this all in one session. If potentially, you know, you went, oh, download it, and you worked on it over the course of a couple of days, you'd close out, we'd reinitiate it, this time picking import completed spreadsheet. We're going to choose our file. So we'll go up to the desktop. Here it is. Nice and easy to find. It's going to do some validation, and it says, whoa, hey, wait a minute. Anytime in benchmarking that you see a yellow triangle, it's a warning telling you something's a little amiss. If you see a red triangle, it's an error and it's kind of a stop red. Um, you need to fix something to move forward. In this case, it's just telling me that my reading start date doesn't match my previous reading's end date. Okay, fine. I purposely did that, so I know that that's okay. If you didn't purposely do that, you can see exactly which worksheet, row, and cell the correction needs to be made in. So hopefully it's real clear and helpful. I'm going to go ahead and leave this as is, not a big deal. And it told me that I modified two readings and I added two readings. Yep, that's what I did. It saw that. I'm good with it. And then we can finish. So now you can see that my last reading date is March 28th. And I now have a warning because I have gaps. I put in that date. We also... So here you can see the 24th to the 25th. And I've got my warnings over here saying that my end date is not continuous with the next reading start date. Do you have to edit that and re-import it, or can you edit it in? You can edit it right in there. Okay. But as you noticed, it's gone. So we kind of take a little liberance. Um, and adjust start dates when they're off by a day and say, hey, you really meant for these to match. And so we mm. correct it for you when it's oh. off by a day. Mm. If it's off by lots of days, then we don't know which way to shift things, but one day isn't um, a big deal. And so we just kind of fix it um, next time you save and close the meter editor. So that's a quick run through. I left time in case there was something specific that somebody in the room or um, on the webcam, has questions about, wants me to demonstrate. So as you can see, our benchmark is not applicable to wastewater, and then I've been screwing around, so our other metrics aren't working at the moment. <clears throat> questions? Yes? So you re-export, <clears throat> you, re you download that export kit each time? Right. If you reuse the same one, that the year that you had last month was the year. Right. Yep. So yeah, each time, um, and if you're doing just the one reading, it's simple enough to just go in to the meter editor and do your one row. Um, if you're doing, you know, multiples, then it's it's better to or easier, I guess, um, to copy and paste. Then you don't have to worry about fat fingering anything if you're just copying and pasting straight from the utilities export or some other. Um, system where that information has been um, provided to you. The second screen makes that a lot easier. Computer screen. Yes, 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 definitely. It makes everything a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, do you know, are some cities uh, having, like the city clerk or a city finance person, simply get the bill every month from utility? Yep, so we have. Entering along with building. Regular building. Yep, uh, we have heard that some organizations have their AP person, so as they're keying it into their accounts payable person, so the check gets cut, the automatic transmission goes, they've got benchmarking up right next to it, and right they just put them, do this one and do this one. Just every month. Yep, yep, so they just have the list up. Um, in that case, if they've got a long list and they're having, um, they're doing the entire city, we've got this meter search up here in the corner. <laughs> So they've got a utility bill in front of them. They can just type in the account number, and they can pull up all of the meters that are tied to that account number. They'll see the meter number, and they can just click on it versus having to know which sites to jump in and out of. 
we can just do a search on our account number. And if there is anybody, not you guys, uh, on the, the webinar who has a question, there's a couple of ways that you can do it. We can either unmute you um, or you can send your question in through the chat and we have somebody monitoring that and we can ask on your behalf. So, I don't know if any have come through. No, we're good. Yes. Um, Sherry, does B3 have any, you know, um, training modules, for example, if you have finance people at the city who you know, may not understand the energy side of this, but yep. putting in the numbers that might help them understand, you know, I didn't know about that neighborhood school before, um, that might lead them down on how to Yep, so out on the main site under about, we've got some webinars. It is kind of buried in the whole overview webinar as far as the different tabs across the top. Um, but we do have a couple different things. Um, and if you have anybody in your organization that is doing the data entry and they just want to ask support, um, you know, I'm doing it this way. Is there a more efficient way for me to do it? Um, feel free, again, at the bottom of all of these home pages in this black banner, it scrolled all the way down, um, the contact forms, our email, and our phone number. So we've got somebody answering this number, um, standard business hours Monday through Friday. And I did send just a couple of handouts for me here or on a piece of paper to bring with them back to their um, city with their contact information and email and things like that. Just come find me out of a handout. Yes. The um the plant data, the plant type data is important because that's public data. Um and the utility data is not put in because it's private data. But if you worked with your utility, is there a way that you could have your electric data added or your energy data added directly? Currently Excel Energy is the only one that provides that data and they do it via Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So we have like I said, integration to get that score um, displayed in benchmarking. We also have integration to pull meter data from Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So Excel has created a process where they can push consumption data it doesn't include demand or cost data, but they can push consumption data, and then we can pull that into benchmarking. Um, so you could get Excel consumption data. Um, note that it does calendarize it, so Excel pushes it the first of the month to the first of the month, so it won't correlate with your utility bill, but it does automatically come in, and you can either do that manually yourself with working with your Excel account rep, or you can um, engage with us, and we have a one-time fee, depending on the number of meters, to kind of do all that hand-holding and get everything linked together um, on your behalf with Excel. But so far, Excel is the only one that does that. But a lot of them do have, um, if you log into their websites, the ability to export and download um, consumption data. Does the calendar data create an issue mm -hmm. in the dates on the meter? You wouldn't be able to, so they only provide the demand data, so you wouldn't be able to go back and add consumption data because they're not going to jive. So you kind of just need to stick with having only the consumption data if you do choose to do the Excel automation. Does that create more work than is necessary? Yeah. Once you get it set up, it's great if you're happy with just consumption data. Um, if you are more of a micromanager and you like to compare things, you're going to have a lot of calculations to try and make those two yeah. drive. So, but some cities are like, we don't have the resources, we don't care, just give us the data so we can get our number and they're good with it. So, we haven't had a lot of organizations that have done that. Yep. For the sites that you have on the subject, how many are entering data? So the, peer, um, the B3 peer rating said there was 22 similar wastewater treatment plants. So one of those is our support site. So there's 21 wastewater treatment plants within the state that have entered in their consumption data, their energy consumption data, to be able to calculate that wastewater um, treatment. Uh, how many? Um, wow. Uh, roughly 250. And, and there's even more. I was going to say, we only have public in here. So any of the private wastewater treatment plants, we don't track in benchmarking. We're just doing the public. <clears throat> Anything else? All 
All right. And so evolution is the other category. So when you said mechanical, that's no, that includes everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Um, aerated, so the the bucketed types currently in yep. D3 are aerated, uh, aerated ponds, non-aerated ponds, um, other low energy, activated sludge, not including activation ditch and activation ditch. Um, so they're bucketed. Oh, okay. yeah. so mechanical yeah. is your activated sludge. Activated sludge. It doesn't include. It wouldn't include your ponds or aerated ponds or aerated ponds. Okay, so an aerated pond is classified as not mechanical. And doesn't get a score. And it doesn't get a score. They can get the baseline and they can get the other metrics that John talked about, the flow normalization and the VOD removed. They just don't get that 1 to 100 score. But they can still see how they're doing in regards to those other metrics. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so we're going to move into our case studies now. Um, so Scott Warner from the city of New Prague is up first, and I'm going to jump back ahead to get us back. I may have hit that too many times. Did somebody know? Or did we go way ahead? We went way back. Oh. We went to the beginning. There's probably a faster way to do this. Yeah, you can just scroll. <laughs> is, your, is, your, is this a touch screen? No. <laughs> it's so old. Oh, wait. Maybe we didn't. We just inserted did I do the, the agenda again. Point? Maybe I just... Yeah, I did the agenda each time. Just so it was like, here's where we are. Although... Was I... I think it was on the, the right one. one. This is yours. Okay, that's why I'm. I'm sorry. I should have just sat there and did nothing. Except they look the same because they're both made up. Right. Okay. Right. And start from this slide. Is this gonna not do what I want? Just down at the bottom right. Hit the one that looks like an easel. Sweet. <laughs> oh, is the clicker? Oh, it's right next to the laptop on the. Oh, there you go. Hey, good morning. This is Scott Warner, City of New Prague, wastewater superintendent. I've been their superintendent for about five years. And about a year ago that uh, AJ approached us for doing uh, some work and we brought some in interesting things from the St. Peter, Minnesota facility that they worked with uh, in 2016. And so some of that will be mentioned. And then also, I, I didn't wasn't a part of this, but the City of Northfield also has the same type of facility. So St. Peter and uh, Northfield, New Prague, and uh, Milwaukee, and uh, it's the Mystic Lake Casino people. They have a there's four systems like this in the state. It's a very uncommon system, very high tech. And we'll get to talking about that. Just a couple little blurbs about uh, Nintap, <laughs> and I'll just zing through these fairly quickly. You can quick read them. It's not. It's already been covered. Uh, the little gal right there in the picture, that was Emily. She was our intern for this last summer. This is her presentation, and I've modified it slightly. Uh, City of New Prague, uh, we, we're uh, in a challenging position. We've got very strict uh, limits from the state because we discharge into a very tiny stream, and we're 7,000 and some residents, so we're a really big, small community, and we're in that growing pains area we're not big enough to have a lot of amenities that the St. Clouds of the world would have, but we've got a lot more than, than what the real tiny communities would have. Uh, we're a Class A wastewater facility. We had a major upgrade in 2010. Uh, we put in 30, $30 million, and uh, the area right in here was our old wastewater plant, and now that's all gone, and, and this is the new plant. Uh, we knew we've got. We knew we had a lot of ideas that for energy savings, but I'm a biologist, and so I'll leave the energy calculations to somebody <laughs> who's uh, got more experience with that. Uh, this is our the overview of our plants. We've got grit removal uh, clarifiers. They're a, a plate clarifier, so they're very efficient. Uh, we add polymer and ferric chloride. Uh, we've got biological aerated filters, which is our biological system, a high tech system. We've got uh, uh, membrane ultrafiltration, so we we remove parts down to very very small. We're start we're getting uh, some bacteria removal 
in our membranes. And we've got UV system and then we've got a backwash from the biological system and also from the membranes. And then we've got uh, aerated sludge storage that with our blower running at 100%, we can get to 0.2 parts per million DO, which is not enough to get rid of odors, but it's, it's enough to uh, uh, get us some digestion. And then we've got a, uh, two rotary presses and a sludge dryer. And then we bag the material that goes out to farm fields from there. We, are, we probably make a class A EQ product for the biosolids, but we haven't been able to prove it yet. And that's something that we're not, not uh, pursuing at this point in time just because of costs and other things involved with it. Our incentives to change, uh, we've exceeded our budget in most years for uh, most of our operations and it's there's it's a very very intensive plant to run and to operate. Uh, we know that the PCA is going to be giving us more requirements as the years go by. Uh, Simpa and Mintat reached out to us to, for uh, ideas for uh, energy savings and, and St. Peter, Minnesota and, and, and Northfield also had uh, good projects. So our project overview is characterize our energy consumption and quantify some uh, scrubbers and HVAC reductions, assess the, the biological area to filter the bath blowers, uh, ultrasonic leak studies for air leaks, and lighting audits. Uh, track the energy usage for, for uh, small wastewater facilities. And this is something Emily all did. She, she crunched the numbers. She <coughs> got the information, put it all together. And $718 per million gallon treated. And so we can see the electrical uh, uh, usage areas. Uh, Odor control is almost a quarter of the plant. The sludge handling, a lot of that's the uh, uh, the blower, I believe. And so there's big areas that are uh, possibilities that we could have for uh, uh, efficiencies. And so the, the scrubbers were in one area that we looked at. Uh, this is an example of an odor scrubber. Yeah, we like the little green yeah, flower. Green yeah, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of placement here. <laughs> yeah, we've got three of these scrubbers on our facility. Uh, the pretreatment and the biosolids treat the vast majority of the odors. The bath one is uh, doesn't treat as much. And so these are the air exchanges per hour. The bath one had the by far the greatest opportunity, and so that's the one Emily pursued. And this is from going from my uh, 7.2 air exchanges per hour well, down to the 4.9, which is close to what the other ones are. We had some significant savings for each year. And so that was a real easy change to make. And then it also talked about switching fans on two of the scrubbers. They would physically work. But whether or not the, the scrubber structure itself would be able to handle the extra airflow, whether we can move enough water because of the wet scrubber, uh, there's enough questions that we didn't know that uh, so we maybe we could get some savings out of it, but uh, there's enough questions that we, we didn't pursue it. Uh, the bath blowers, that's a significant possibility. They're 40 horsepower blowers. Uh, they're there's across the line starters, so when they turn on, there's a there's a, a blip on the on the uh, power monitor, and so uh, this is a this is our biological system. The, the water flows in through here, it flows down, and it flows into the cell, which is aerated, and then this area right in here, kind of the black and looks like salt and pepper. That's actually the median. Three millimeter polystyrene beads, and there's zillions of them in each of the four cells that we have. And there's a, a concrete nozzle deck that keeps all the beads in place, but allows the water to flow through. And this type of system can remove uh, uh, CBOD, TSS, it does some ammonia, and then uh, potentially there's some other small things that are going on in there. Uh, 
the big thing is is that the CB or the the DO is is high, and so we were we were running um, at uh, the filter the filter velocity. We were running at one gallon per minute per square foot. We uh, we tried going to two based off of what St. Peter saw, and we we that was too much. We were getting TSS burps through the plant when when the equipment would start and stop. And so we went down to we tried 1.7, and just to give us a little bit of safety factor, we went to 1.5. And then we went we were running two cells all the time. We went down to one cell, and then as future work has shown us, we've got when we are dewatering our sludge, we've got to go put three cells online because of the ammonia load that goes into the facility. It's it's in the the, the two two hundred range milligrams per liter. So it's we we need the extra capacity when we are dewatering our sludge. And so when we're not dewatering the sludge, um, we've got the opportunity for some pretty significant savings. And then just by adjusting our SCADA settings, so it's eleven thousand know, dollars on an annual basis. And then another one that we just got budgeted for in the tentative budget is uh, to put uh, blower or VFDs on the blowers, and so that will allow us to run the blowers at 85% or something like that to uh, have the significant cost reductions. And right now we're with the blowers on at 100%, we got 7.6 milligrams of DO. Uh, we want to get down to somewhere in that three, four to five range uh, as it leaves the bath. And one other thing to consider is that, uh, okay, we've got, if we, if we can get down to four, we're looking at another $8,000 in savings on an annual basis. And so one thing that uh, we've also got to be concerned with is we have a, a deal limit in our effluent of seven. So we've got to make sure that we're putting enough oxygen in as the, the as the ethanol leaves the plant, so that way we we've, we've made our, our permit requirements, and so we've got and also our our ammonia uh, limit changes depending on what time of the year it is. Uh, we we're just as I went through the plant for energy savings, and we found all sorts of little tiny pin leaks for air, and a lot of them you can't hear. But if you happen to be up there working on it, oh, there's a little, there's a little breeze coming out of it. Well, they used a, uh, a SIMPA came along, and they were able to get some equipment, and so we could find all sorts of these little tiny leaks. And so we've fixed a bunch of leaks, and we're always fixing leaks. We look, we've got one of the operators that's kind of taking it upon himself to go around and, and look for the leaks, and he's found and fixed a lot of them. You know, thousand bucks a year. It's just a little bit of maintenance and. And so uh, we can save some money. Another one of the big factors is our lighting audit. And we went through and we're looking at, uh, we've got a lot of lights that get left on 24 7, so that way you can see what you're doing. But yet, when you, and this is our big hallway, you can see that most of the lights aren't even on, but they're available to be on if we would need them. And so we've got uh, the stairwells have lights and there's a lot of rooms that have at least one light on, just so you can you can see, so that enough to walk through that room, but yet not enough to burn a lot of light or burn a lot of uh, energy. And so the thought was, is if we went change everything over to LEDs, including the outside lights, we would uh, be able to have a lot less maintenance and a lot less electric. And so doing all the calculations, we're looking, oops, sorry, looking at uh, potentially two thousand dollars in annual savings. So if we look at everything, and we're looking at somewhere on the annuals of $30,000 in, in savings, and we've got everything that's uh, it's either been done or it's budgeted to be done. And then another thing that's not on this list, uh, we've got a couple other possibilities, uh, VFDs at our main list station. After Emily did this presentation, we had the gift, or I'm not sure if it's a gift or not, we took a, light, a direct lightning strike to our main lift station. And so 
now we got VFDs because the soft starts were fried. That yeah. metal pole that you put up right <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, it wasn't that bad then. The pump itself had a six inch diameter gouge in the in inside the electrical and the windings in the rotor and the stator area. It was bad. And that motor was, was fried. And so we were uh, rebuilding it. We're resizing the pumps to make sure that they're the right size for some, even for additional cost savings. And so uh, uh, we were doing all doing some of these other things. And there's a possibility uh, we may be able to take that bath odor scrubber down a little bit more. And potentially save us a little bit more money. Our sludge aeration blower, uh, that one's our big one. It's a 100 horsepower blower, it runs wide open, but it's not giving us enough oxygen to, to really do what we needed to do. And so I'm not sure what other options we've got for that one. That's, that's a future study. Uh, these are all the people that uh, helped make this uh, study a success. And a little comments, appreciate Emily's time putting this all together for us. And, and it was a, a good study for us. And I'm glad we have the ability to uh, save significant resources throughout the decades that are going to be following. And, and with that, any questions? Yes, sir. You got a small little fridge. Yeah, I have to work on that one. See what happens. <laughs> yes, sir. Other benefits to a VFD is like on your floor, if you're not, you know, at 60 hertz, let's just say, and you're not up to your amp drop, you can only speed it if the door is capable of doing this. You could run it. Right. Right now, that 100 horse blower is on a soft start, okay. and so there wasn't the foresight to be able to give us that ability. Right. Right. But I know even some of our pumps that are lift stations, mm -hmm. we them during high load. Right. Just because the pumps are wore out, but as long as they stay under your service factor, they're up to like 67. Right. I mean, very inefficient, you say, but if you need something, that's another alternative. That's yes, it is. It is, yes. Right. And, and this actually brings up another point. Right. 15 minutes at once a month. I mean, you're turning pumps on and off, you're done for the month and you get charged a thousand bucks. Yeah, right. You have to run your generator to test your pumps, then you're not on the utility. Right. You know, I mean, these are like operator things that people have done, but. Right. This group to understand there are other ways to. I mean, but operators don't know the utility bills and what you're getting charged for. A, you know that peak. I mean, it's 15 minutes. Just you, know, you can wipe you out. That's you right. If you're jogging pumps, just make sure they run for the month. I mean, exactly. I mean that's, that's what I'm noticing. Right. It's it's big. It's a big money saver. Yes. Another thing that, that needs to be mentioned is as we get more technical, as we get more uh, more sensors involved, you know, DO probes and and uh, ORP probes throughout the facilities, we need the technical people on staff that are able to troubleshoot them and calibrate them and maintain them. And so that's the the energy efficiency things are important, but we've got to have this this we don't we no longer need somebody who spends their day turning valves and just turning on pumps and equipment. We need the people with the the technical expertise to be able to service and maintain and calibrate and and understand really what the trending is is saying. So that's just something for future considerations uh, that are directly tied with this. Yes. Um, you said you worked a little bit with Simba um, to get going on this project. Um, can you say more about that? Simba has. Uh, New Prague has their own utilities, and they're as a member of Simpa. Uh, Simpa came alongside of us. They were real uh, supportive. They paid for a good portion of uh, the intern uh, at, at the site, and they were real good to work with. They brought in some extra equipment, some extra expertise, and so they're uh, very friendly, easy to work with, and I highly recommend it if if your community is involved with them. So, 
excuse me, is that part of their uh, conservation improvement program uh, initiative or goals that they had to help you with that? I'm not sure. I SIPA wanted to see us, you know, to, to save money for the city, and so they wanted to see because it also helps them in the long run. And so they they were big in, on helping us get involved with it. And, and then that list, uh, the MCAP helped you come up with the list of uh, opportunities. And some of them you could implement right away, but those that have required capital, how did you plan to implement that? Once we, once the, uh, well, once the other community, St. Peter, had those things done and they had success with them, I was on the phone with uh, AJ, who was an engineer with Mintap, and she said, well, if you do this and this and this with the settings you have, then it was real easy and to uh, take advantage of what St. Peter had done with minimal work on our end. And so it was, it was a, a no-brainer, shall we say. But the other ones, uh, once uh, Emily was able to calculate the numbers, she could say, a, you're looking at a four to five year payback for the back blowers or a two to three year payback for all the lighting retrofits that that was a, a real easy sell for my boss to take it to the city council and to to put it in the budget request and so the savings does the city uh, did the city use those for your capital improvements basically did you get to save keep those savings or did it affect rates next year general fund or? it will the it will allow us to, our, our electric consumption will go down, yeah. but it will be funded by the electrical savings. And then in time, I anticipate we'll find more things that we can use the savings use money the savings. for to further our electrical reductions. So it's in the enterprise fund. Yeah, yeah we, we keep most of it. Eventually, some way it works back to the general fund, but that's because we're running in deficit anyway. Oh. And so it's just that's it's just pure economics right now. What is your normal budget? How does the savings compare to? I it's normally in a, on an annual basis, we're looking at about two hundred to two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars in just electricity mm -hmm. for this facility, and so thirty thousand. Really means something. Well, ten to fifteen percent, easy man. Uh, just were you? I, I don't know if you were aware. Of, uh, Department of Commerce had a couple of programs that would help uh, provide alternative funding mechanisms if you didn't have capital. Uh, were you aware of those? Or? No, I'm not aware of those. So uh, maybe there's a discussion. Of, you know, just provide an example. Sure. Mm -hmm. hey, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Our, our host. Right. Thank you. All right, last talk of the workshop. Um, my name is Tracy Hodell. I'm with the City of St. Cloud. I have been here for, will be 17 years in January, so I've been here a long time. Actually started my career here at this facility as a laboratory technician just across the hall over here when it used to be the lab over there. Um, I toured this facility when I was in college and for many folks, and, and maybe some of you even don't even know that these facilities exist, these wastewater treatment facilities, these drinking water treatment facilities, and I know when I arrived here and I toured the drinking water facility that's by the St. Cloud Hospital in St. Cloud downtown, um, it just amazed by how awesome these facilities are and what these facilities do, and specifically this facility with environmentally and the positive impact that you can make by um, working at this facility as far as creating clean water. I mean, our, our wastewater industry has changed so much in the last few years. Uh, this facility used to, be, uh, used to be called the sewage treatment plant, <laughs> and we still use that word. I don't like it, but we still use it. Um, for your wastewater folks out there, we use biosolids for solids. We, it's a highly valuable, um, reusable product. Um, we return beautiful clean water back to the Mississippi River. Uh, we produce a fuel source that I'll talk about more today. Uh, we produce solar here on site. You'll see the two, two facilities that we have here so far. And um, we produce a liquid fertilizer product here as well. And we're actually under construction to produce another fertilizer product that's pelletized. So a lot of great things. And I'm, it's so cool that 
uh, we're honored and excited to host this event because Lindsay asked to um, host here and also to speak because um, you know Green Steps, as Abby mentioned, it helps municipalities and cities achieve their sustainability goals and we, wastewater treatment facilities use a lot of electricity and I think that's great that a workshop was dedicated to this because you truly can make a difference and as I sat through the first couple presentations I'm like this is just the it's excited to talk today, but even more so because all the talks just wrap into this really, really well, and they go together well. So kudos to putting together the agenda. Just you know, kudos to the speaker. Yeah, no, it, it worked. <laughs> it worked really well, really well. So my focus today is I'm really going to talk about kind of the things that we have done in St. Cloud and how we're using B3 to do those things. And we'll start with that. Little history, my outline for today is going to go talk about um, City of St. Cloud history with B3, and then talk about how we're using B3, and then specifically wrap up with how our wastewater utility is using B3 right now. So some of you folks are very familiar with B3, you don't like seeing these symbols. <laughs> <laughs> our history with B3 when it first was started was a lot of these, unfortunately, and I have to admit that we were not the best at getting all the information in there. Um, we saw a lot of the red ones and a lot of these. Some of them aren't so bad, but when you have like a screen full of them, it's kind of overwhelming. Um, and Really, I know you're not supposed to say but, but uh, our reason of why we had a lot of these is because it's a bit overwhelming to get all that data into B3, right? City of St. Cloud, we're a large municipality and we provide a lot of services and people don't realize that what level and volume of services that a city does provide. We have 400 plus meters in within our city. And so to try to get those into the system was overwhelming. Um, so we had a couple, so we kind of dabbled in, we tried to update it, but we never had all our meters in there because um, as Sherry mentioned, we don't, we didn't have at that time, we saw our treatment facilities were like excluded because we couldn't benchmark against others. Um, a lot of the non-building like traffic signals and um, street lights and all of those were not in there, lift stations weren't in there. Uh, water towers weren't in as a possibility to enter. So we actually are using B3 a little bit more in a unique way, I think unique way, and maybe others are using it this way, but we're more using it as an energy management tool. So, and, and benchmarking is a piece of that for us. And these are some of the things that we have recently done that has really triggered our use into B3. The solar, we've done a bunch of solar, I'll talk more why that's a big trigger. And we've done a wastewater energy efficiency project, and we've also added CHP out here in a biofuel recovery project. And this all started in uh, 2014 when we did a resource recovery and energy efficiency master plan out here. So as I go through these and, and talk about what we've done and how we're using it, um, for those that are involved with projects and, and from A to Z as far as getting the funding in place and design in place and construction and then commissioning and then actually operating the new systems and the projects. It's amazing that this work that we've done and huge credit to the kudos and to the staff here that have made that happen. And it's been fortunate to work and some of my coworkers are back there, Pat in the back and Lisa and Emma have really helped with getting us where we're at today. So as I mentioned, the city has 400 plus meters. So on B3, we ended up actually putting all those 400 plus meters in these categories. So for the city of St. Cloud, this is an uh, overview of the meters and the categories that we put those meters into. As you can see, wastewater in 2016, we used a lot of electricity. Water, you're using a lot of electricity. Our, um, this is the ice arena, so ice arenas use a lot of electricity. Our street lighting people, and one thing I don't think a lot of communities do is add up their street lighting. You know why? <laughs> too many meters, exactly. It's too much work. And you add them all together and you come up with this huge, huge number of how much uh, KWH's energy those systems use. So does that street lighting just include what you own or is it also Excel on? This is just St. Cloud. Okay. Yeah, this is the ones that we pay for. Mm -hmm. um, we have the library, uh, we have a convention center, our police. These are all our park structures within St. Cloud. 
We have an airport. So, you know, we provide a lot of services, as do all of you. And if you looked at the numbers, we use a lot of electricity and almost $3 million in electrical costs. This is not natural gas, just electrical costs. So um, as John, I took a little bit turned from the quote that he said, but you can't manage what you don't measure, right? So pre-B3, before we started using B3 more actively, what happened with our utilities bill is all those 400 meters went to our finance department. And then there was a person in finance, and usually what we get our utility bills two, three, sometimes four weeks after the last meter reading. So then finance gets it, and then finance goes through it all and codes it to all of the different programs that our city has to pay for them. And then maybe two, three, sometimes four weeks later, it gets sent to the actual facilities that are being coded. Um, for example, this is, this is a packet of, this is actually our traffic signals. So it goes through and codes all these and then puts all these. This is just traffic signals for one month, not a year, just one month. Um, and so they get coded, and, and then we got them. And honestly, they got sent to the facilities, and really nobody looked at them, us included, and as closely as we should. We did sometimes, and we got better at it as years went on. But nobody looked at nobody, and nobody, nobody in finance, not that they don't understand the bill, but the demand and what this fee means and what that fee means. And, and so then recently, in 2015, when we started the solar initiative, um, we actually, everybody, like a whole bunch of people, just got into B3 and started updating everything. So from 2015, we have all of our meters, 400 plus meter updated current. And really, it took teamwork to go in and just get it all done because it's overwhelming. I get it. It's a lot of work. But once you get it in, it's such a great management tool. You got everything in one spot. Instead, we had a huge amount of spreadsheets trying to find the data. Or you have your big piles of papers that you can go try to find. And then you're researching for where's that account? And you get your premise number. And it's overwhelming. So we really like it because it's once it's in the system, it, it, it's, it's easy and it's quick to grab things. Of course, kind of um, speaking to the choir here, preaching to the choir, this, these are some other cool things that you can use B3 for that we have specifically. Um, it's a way to measure your energy efficiency projects. And I'll show you a couple slides on how we can visibly see what we're doing and the impact of the projects that we've done. Your baseline comparison. So wastewater, for example, we used 2013 as our baseline because we did a huge $48 million upgrade project out here from 2010 till 2013. And then um, as we were talking about the blowers, a lot of things were oversized. Mixers were oversized. And you have to go in and take a look at it and see what you can do to save energy. And so um, we set our 2013, and that's 2014 is really when we started a lot of energy work. Optimization of buildings, reports, it's a really key and easy thing to go in and, and play with and get reports and numbers very quickly instead of looking at massive spreadsheets or looking in your hard files. And of course, you can measure your money. So like Sherry was saying that, you know, Excel can do the consumption piece in there, but if you don't have the money to compare it, you're going to have to go in and enter it one by one anyway. So just to have the consumption, from our perception, it's just not as much value as getting all the information in there. So this is a, a community solar garden. How many people raise by hand? I know I can't see the webinar folks, but are subscribed to community solar gardens? Couple, couple. Okay. Um, I think this is was big and is going to continue to be big. So I think it's a valid point to bring up for municipalities. Is municipalities? We have been visited since 2014. Pat, 2015 really got hit hard in 2015 by the developers. <laughs> And it's because we're in municipalities, right? We're not going to, we have 25 year agreements. We're not going to move and leave. We have that security, financial security. And so, and we were huge energy users. Um, so that's why, but I, one of the reasons why I think B3 is important about this and why it, it was a great tool is in order to subscribe to any of these community solar gardens, you have to know how much energy you are actually using. And you can only subscribe to a certain amount. So if you don't know how much you're using, and beforehand we had no idea. We never looked at citywide energy expenditures. And B3 was a tool that we could use to look at it citywide. So we knew how much we could subscribe to these community solar gardens. 
And so we were able to subscribe to over 20 million kilowatt hours and um, excited and happy to say that four of our project sites that we're subscribed to have been commissioned. So we have almost 14 million kilowatt hours that are now uh, community solar gardens that are generating electricity as we speak right now. So there's two more project sites that we're subscribed to. And um, this is very conservative numbers. Um, we were fortunate to get locked into flat rates. So we basically know what we're going to pay for electricity for the next 25 years. And um, we'll be receiving bill credits on our December invoices. So I think YB3 is, is a good tool and why it played into that is because we were able to really look at what our overall consumption was and what we could subscribe to. Because you could, if you didn't know what you were, you missed out on some opportunities for subscription. Mm -hmm. And this is a great slide because this is another um, reason why we love B3. Um, huge, huge difference and this is all data that you could just pop up just like that instead of having going through the files. This is annual bill, utility bills for the city, so lots of paper. Another great um, reason to use B3 is if you're doing any guaranteed savings projects. So we did two big ones. Um, we did the streetlight improvement project um, that Pat Shea led, and we also did a our wastewater energy efficiency and biofuel project, recovery project. Those are both uh, guaranteed savings projects. So what that means is the operational savings is paying for the debt service on the project. And the reason why B3 is important is they have to guarantee the savings. The energy service provider has to guarantee those savings amount, and they have to get that data from somewhere. So B3 is a great tool. And then also when you get your, everybody has to do a monitoring and verification report after a year and you can continue it throughout the whole project if you want, but this is the one for our energy efficiency project. And you actually look at what was guaranteed as savings, and then you go through all the actual bills, and then you figure out what your actual savings were. So just our energy efficiency part, so this is kind of our summary page. Um, we had a year as of April 30th, 2017, we had projected um, around 70,000, 73,000 was the actual guaranteed amount and we ended up saving 99,000. So we exceeded our uh, savings, our guaranteed savings on the project in year one, which was awesome. Again, another cool way to use B3. Just very quickly to go through our energy efficiency, since um, we had a lot of wastewater folks in the room, um, we had two parts, our energy efficiency and biofuel recovery project. Um, the big first part was our energy efficiency part. So a lot of things that others were talking about this morning is we did LED lighting, interior, exterior, HVAC controls. Um, this is a 1976 went into operation facility. So a lot of it had the original controls and we put one into one master controls. Actually exceeded our expectations on savings on there. We replaced our 1974, 76 air compressors, which you can imagine are much more energy efficient these days. Mm -hmm. And then our blower optimization with MinTap. Um, I'll show you in these slides what an amazing impact that project had at this facility. We too had an um, uh, intern named Emily who helped us out, unfortunately <laughs> <laughs> enough. Um, our industrial electronics technician, Jake Ethan, and then Emily Campion um, with MinTap came here the summer of 2014. And you will see in our slides just the impacts of that work that we did on the blowers there. And really for us, we didn't add VFDs out here, but we changed the way we controlled it and programmed it and how we operated our valves. And there was no capital cost. And we're saving over a million kilowatt hours a year by making that change. And then the second part of our energy project out here is our biofuel recovery project. It took a lot longer because it's a design project. We had to figure out what kind of equipment we wanted to generate electricity with, how we wanted to use that biofuel that we're generating here. Um, and then we had to pick out the size of the generators. Sizing of generators is extremely important because um, you want to be running your generator as efficient as possible. And so you don't want to oversize it. Um, and then we also, we do produce a great fuel, but it is dirty fuel. We have to get rid of the hydrogen sulfide 
we have to get rid of the moisture, we have to get rid of the siloxanes that are inside the gas. So we had mm -hmm. biogas conditioning, and then we had a generator. And this project, our generator started up on February 23rd of 2017. Again, I'll show you a couple slides what a huge impact that project has had out here energy-wise. So here's some V3 shots for you guys. I love this screen because you can see our 2013 red line. That's our baseline. So that's when our new treatment process went in effect. And then you see 2014 right here, this orangish yellow line. This is exactly when we implemented Emily and Jake's work from MinCap. You can see us here. From, this is basically our blower optimization change and how we reduced, it, reduced our energy consumption on a monthly basis. The other big one you see, the big drop, is 2016 compared to our baseline. So this is all our other energy efficiency work. This is no generation, by the way. This is all lights, HVAC, um, equipment replacement, building envelope, those type of things. So we, we hit energy efficiency first, and then we started with the recovery and production. So you'll see here, February 23rd, our demand dropped to very, very low as far as what we're purchasing off the grid. Now the new um, software and B3, so this isn't our energy consumption because we're using what we're producing right. So mm -hmm. the new software that was it released last week, right? Yep, last Thursday. So that you can look at, I don't have screenshots from the new version yet, but you can look at what you're consuming as a whole. So it adds those PV renewables onto that screen too. And then so easily go into B3 and you can grab this data and you can see like 2013 is our baseline year. This is um, how much purchase energy, electrical energy. 2014, this difference here is min tap work. And 2014 and 15 again is that's a straight up, actually if you look at 13 versus 15, that's all min tap lower optimization work that we saw a reduction on. 16 includes our energy efficiency work. And this is what we've only purchased in 2017 so far. That's with what we're producing and what we're saving, so our energy efficiency. So we've dropped significantly of how much non-renewable energy that we are purchasing. And a lot of people look at it per year, but I'd love to look at it accumulated as well. So 2014, we started doing this work, right? So you compare your 13 savings, compare it to 13, compare it to 13. And you accumulate that. And just since we started doing work in 2014, we have saved over seven, saved or generated almost seven million kilowatt hours electricity here. Which is awesome. Mm -hmm. And then money. Everybody cares about money, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we like about B3 too. Is again, you look at these cost savings each year. These are annual, and these look great. You know, but when you add that together, that's seven hundred thousand dollars that we've mm -hmm. saved over the last four years in our 2017. It's not even done yet. So, here's a couple more shots as I wrap up here on uh, B3. So we're a little bit, as Sherry mentioned, we're a little bit complicated um, because we do have a lot of different meters here. We can't wait to get a biofuel generator meter um, on B3 as well. But we have that flow meter. So, and then we have two PVs for our 20. This is that little rooftop. We call it our baby solar as you come up the patio. <laughs> <laughs> and then we got our bigger solar right here. And then actually we got a, our city is hosting a five million, um, or five megawatt solar garden, community solar garden out there. Um, we're hosting it. We don't own it, um, but the developer, we have a lease agreement with the developer out there. So this is our kind of main meter page. This is where the data is coming in and from uh, PCA, and Minnesota Pollution Control, Control Agency is popping that information and we don't do that. Uh, this is just a screen of what uh, we talked about benchmarking, John talked about it in the range. So if it was 5,000 to 1,500 or something, was that the range that you had? Sounds right. Yeah. I don't have those memorized. Yeah. <laughs> I think that was what it was. So our baseline was about 19, so we were on the higher end before we did any energy efficiency work. And I know a lot of you folks can't see that far back, but we're down to 1466 in 2016. And then once we get the new software, we can actually look at the whole, because um, it says 421, that's too good to be true. <laughs> it doesn't include the stuff that we're using, you know, we're producing on site. But I, you know, 
1466 is, is we haven't gone up from that before so we're doing really well on the spectrum of that range. Then you have the BOD normalized as well. So 2.5 is kind of your benchmark that we started with in 2013. Um, in 2016, we're down to 1.98 kilograms. So one hours per kilogram BOD level. And this is kind of the screenshot that Sherry had on her presentation. Uh, and it just kind of shows this is where we started producing a lot of electricity, all the orange. Even though it says PV renewable, this is biofuel plus solar. It's not all solar. So yeah, we, I think we use it a little bit more in a unique way than other people do for B3, but I, it, it, we're excited for any new features that get added. We're going to continue to use it. One of the other cool things we do is we grab this information out and we create de departmental energy reports and we sit down with each of these departments and we go through and say, you know, we go sit down with parks and say, hey, you know, this building over here is using a lot of electricity or why has this meter been off for so long? Or, and they have, they know that so they can, in, yeah, we need to fix that or we need to cancel that account or we need to, something's running and not supposed to be running. So that's another cool way that we're using B3. So any questions that either I or any of my colleagues can answer for you guys? <laughs> um, how do you communicate this to residents? I mean, that's, it's incredible. You're saving nearly a million dollars a year in, in their money, basically. And so how do you communicate? successes? We've done a couple updates at council meetings like on the solar initiative um, and we've talked about it in that way. We try to get the PR out there. We've had, a, had the Sinkle Times out here talking about some of the work that we're doing. Um, sadly and believe it or not people don't like talking about wastewater. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get it. Um, so that's why we love it when anybody comes here and we love to Tours. Um, we really send that message and drive it home when, when, the, when the students come to. We have a lot of kids groups that come out. Um, we, we present as much as we possibly can to try to spare, sh you know, share the word and stuff. But um, yeah, we definitely want to get the residents involved in the, in the solar, kind of giving them a heads up that you know we'll support and we're leading it, and you know mm -hmm. we want. And there's a lot of interest out there. And Pat, you might have something else to add to that. So. Tracy showed that solar slide that yeah. showed the, the cost savings over a length of time. You know, in 2018, I think it's that 177 number. Mm -hmm. That's a decrease in scale. Mm -hmm. And we, we tell people that a lot of our energy use were fixed at today's price. It actually don't, it doesn't really count in the market. And so, as that number gets up to five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars a year, mm -hmm. then the city budget will really reflect mm -hmm. the city itself to be in a good position for both property tax and enterprise funds. So I think it once it actually starts to develop, then I think the, the good news will spread a little bit more. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So the follow up <coughs> sorry, uh, to that is communicating to city council and, and how receptive are they and do, does that start making it easier to get projects funded to do more? Yeah, our city council and our city administration, our mayor, our um, city administrator are very, very um, huge supporters mm -hmm. of the work that we're doing in the energy. And uh, we signed a solar initiative in 2015. The council approved a resolution to do that. Um, a lot of our projects we go through and, and the very high marks and a lot of support on that end, so that's been great. Yeah. I'm going to keep asking questions. If you <laughs> oh, well, I've, got, I've got one. So, so the state auditor two or three years ago, maybe, along with the uh, University of Minnesota, put up this, uh, what is it called? The infrastructure, infra stress trans yes. yeah. infrastructure Stress Transparency Tool. We're looking at the enterprise fund, you know, one year, five year, maybe going out 10, 20 years. Is that something that You've seen, you've looked at. That's the one that was at the Innovative, right? Yeah, yeah, we've seen it. I. They, they track the really the PFA. It's a PFA. Yeah, that's what I thought it was. Yeah, yeah. 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 St. Cloud shows up as a as a document. But, um, a lot of these are self-funding. So uh, yeah, we didn't raise any rates for these. So they don't they don't really go through the state mm -hmm. to kind of make that. So there'll be a lag. But as the auditors come through and start, I think they'll start to, that, that project or that program is still kind of developing. So 
think it's still it's still open. So I, yeah. I don't know yeah. that some of these projects will show up as part of that just yet, but we have something when we get on it and we'll kind of suggest that they incorporate that in. Okay. Mm -hmm. And we are offering a tour. So if anyone is interested, we could show you around. I know it's cold out, but we have lots of tunnels, so we can <laughs> tunnel it to each room, um, go outside to go check out the awesome generator. And um, actually today, our construction project that we're doing to um, reduce the volume of our liquid uh, fertilizer product, our biocells that we produce on site, um, we have that ongoing, and they're doing, you'll see a big, huge gas membrane that was just up. But they're actually um, turning that on today and doing some training and filling that with biofuel. And what we're using that big bubble for is um, primarily a big reason is for control. We have floating covers in our anaerobic digesters. So if you can consistently feed the biofilter and the generator, it's much more safe, especially in the wintertime when your covers do freeze and you got to be up there with hot seas trying to thaw it and there could be some safety <laughs> issues there. Uh, so that was our huge, huge reason. And then also with the biogas storage and the biofuel storage, we have the ability to store the energy and send it to the generator when the timing makes sense as it relates to when solar is being produced. Also, you can save it and during on peak when you're paying almost double for electricity, you can save it for that time, and then when you're going on the grid, go go on your off peak when it's half the price, right? Mm -hmm. So you can save money that way, and so we're excited to have that flexibility and that tool online as of maybe today, if all goes well. So. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. Um, and, and just one plug, um, there, uh, we've worked on contacting a little bit, and um, they can be complex um, contracts, and Commerce does uh, provide um, a program to support the needs. Uh, if they have to choose uh, that they need assistance, so I don't know if you have another. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. I didn't know if we're at the discussion right yeah, now, that's yeah. ask. But uh, yeah, as she mentioned, uh, Pat mentioned they use performance contracting, and it is, uh, it, it, which helps you, you don't necessarily have to uh, be dependent on that capital budgeting process and use of uh, uh, city uh, bonding authority. You, it is an all in addition to helping develop the project and identify the opportunities, it can help uh, provide an alternative financing mechanism. And we, we have actually two programs that are, um, one is the Guaranteed Energy Savings Program, which as it implies the savings are guaranteed. The other one is the Local Energy Efficiency Program, which allows you to do the study and implement things on a planned bid build basis. But these both programs enable you to utilize lease purchase financing as an alternative financing mechanism. And so using one or the other uh, helps you do that, where otherwise uh, you're dependent on bonding. Mm -hmm. But with that said, either program could use projects funded through traditional bonding. So you have some, you have some handouts and things that anybody yeah. wants to get a handout. Yeah, if there. anyone has any questions, uh, yeah, we've got a handout. Even. Follow up with that uh, later, also. You can contact either Pete in the room, I think. <laughs> 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 Pete and Lynn Chowman. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
a lot of it was a team effort, mm -hmm. but where did it all come from? Well, I think the biggest thing is that it's interesting because I, I do really feel like a large part of it. We've always, you know, been part of Green Steps for a long time, Green Step Cities, and, and but I do think the wastewater, the potential of how big a user we are, and on the other side, on the drinking water side as well, is we are large users and we just felt that that was our responsibility to our energy efficiency and energy related work. And yeah, I, I really do think it was the people though. I think the people we're excited about, everyone here is excited about working on it and the passion they put in above and beyond efforts to make things happen. And I think that really triggered citywide energy work in the solar and so really the people that wanted to make Great job. Um, are there any questions from the webinar? You're unmuted, so you're going to speak freely. <laughs> any questions out there? Or you can remute yourself really fast if you don't want us to hear you. <laughs> I wish we could take you on the tour with us. Yeah. Um, okay, hearing okay. none. No? I just want to let you know you have an appointment at 11. I have an appointment at 11. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I just wanted to, one thing yeah. I want to point out. I think uh, that uh, St. Cloud, they took the right approach, you know, looked at their efficiency first, then they moved to renewables. Right. Mm -hmm. And so many people want it. Efficiency is not the, you know, real sexy thing. You know, nobody cares about a new VFD on their blower. Uh, you know, I would beg to differ. Love was professor. <laughs> uh, the city council loves seeing those solar panels, right? But, uh, my point being is that's absolutely the right approach, and we all need to uh, do, you know, evaluate the efficiency opportunities. You know, you you can look at them simultaneously, but you really need to do them ahead of the. Uh, and so they should be applauded for actually taking the right approach on that. Yeah. And I just, great presentation. Thank you. And thank, yeah. you. Um, thank you to all of our presenters. This was a really, truly informative um, workshop, and I think it came together very nicely. And, and I appreciated everything that you guys all had to say. So thank you all um, for bringing your knowledge uh, to this group. Um, our next workshop is. January 3rd, 2018, I should say. We are not going to repeat 2017. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that should be 2018. Uh, we'll be talking about electric vehicles. I think so we're really going to dive into electric vehicles for your uh, municipal fleets as well. And so um, uh, it's, it's a hot topic. So that will be back in St. Paul, the League of Minnesota Cities. And then, as always, it will be available through. The webinar, so we hope that you can join us if that's of interest to you. Um, and and if there are other if there are other folks yeah. that want to host a field trip in the future, let us know. Let us know. And then this. Yeah. So this is recorded, and we have the slides and stuff too. Yeah. So I think what we should do now in closing is maybe take a quick bathroom break, and for <laughs> anybody who wants to go on the tour of me. Back out in this. Yeah, just meet out, out front there by the kitchen. We do have vests. We are under construction. We'll stay out of the hard hat area, but if you could grab a vest, they're made right by the banner there, and then um, group up. And whoever has a vest on, I know who wants to get tour, and Pat and I will be walking you around. So. They fit over a giant. Absolutely. Sure thing. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks, okay, well, everyone online. Thanks, everyone for coming. Bring a coach. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Bring a coach. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 Yeah, good. Good. Um, yeah. yeah. We're, 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 we're just stuck. Yeah. 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 Yeah.